All right, so Simon, thank you for uh, joining me on the uh, show today. No worries, my friend. Good to be here. Yeah, great. So if the, uh, just in case people in the audience haven't heard of you or know who you are, could you just give us a, a, a bit of a background about what it is you do? Yeah, 100%. Uh, so I'm Simon from Iron Paradise Fitness. And my, my main thing, I guess, in the, the fitness industry, if you want to call it that, is I work with people who mainly have some form of body composition goal, i.e. fat loss, build some muscle, focusing mainly on resistance training, hypertrophy, less so on, no, don't really do CrossFit or anything like that, but really specific on resistance-based training, and generally speaking, when I work with people, it is, I would say, I guess we class it as gen pop. So people who are busy, workers, things like that, maybe haven't got time to do the sort of training that a pro bodybuilder would do, but wants to get a decent physique at the same time. So it's about like trying to maximize their time and maximize um, their uh, their goals. Really. So that's kind of what I do and where I'm at. Cool, man. And then, you know, just for legal reasons, I'm going to have to blur out that, uh, um that fitness program that you mentioned earlier on i, I can't recall um it, probably something around fit cross or functional it's, combined fitness i spell it or, with a k i spell it with a k so you're oh right. right okay yeah yeah, yeah. like a k, <laughs> a k a k and two eyes so it's like oh, yeah, anyway we don't need to go down that line um so yeah i mean and you were you were actually uh, in the corporate background before you fell into fitness weren't you let's tell us a little bit that's more right about yeah that. Yeah, so for the best part of, I'd say, I'd, the numbers escape me, but I'm going to say 12 to 15 years. So when I left university, I went straight into corporate life. So I had um, quite a nice career. I worked my way up through um, quite a, a well-known automotive brand in the UK. Mm -hmm. I guess when that is. It's a dog in the background. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I, I went straight into that corporate life, into marketing, sales, customer service, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I'd always had very much an, an active interest in fitness. And when I was in my early 20s, I was very much into uh, weight training, bodybuilding, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. I then kind of drifted away from weight training and went into competitive cycling. So I was actually competing in time trials for in, in the UK at a national mm -hmm. level up until the point where I decided to accidentally jump off a bike and break my hip. And that then led me to say, well, okay, right now I need to get back into the gym, build up some strength, kind of get back into like a bit of rehab. And that's, that really was the catalyst and the snowball for me to then start to get qualified in the fitness industry. Cause I got the bug then for training, got the bug for um, reading up about nutrition and finding out what really does work mm -hmm. so that was five years ago and I guess that snowball has turned into kind of where I am right now um, but I feel like as you mentioned that kind of corporate background is you know yes I haven't had 20 years in the fitness industry mm -hmm. but I think that the corporate side of things has enabled me to basically like in a way, get in, empathize with people a lot more who are, okay, you're in this office environment, you're in this sort of busy job, you're working uh, not necessarily nine to five, probably longer hours than that. How do you actually mm. fit fitness into that? And how do you actually construct programs? And how do you actually manage your nutrition around that? And mm. I feel like that gives me a little bit of an inroad having been in that exact position. Yeah, you're basically like, I've been there, I know your pain. <laughs> exactly i do know the pain i do know the pain sitting in an office job is is not fun well it depends what office job you got i guess but it's not fun and uh yeah trying to fit in workouts that maybe you see online mm -hmm. so you say okay this this dude's written this amazing workout and yeah he's a fitness professional and that's all he does is mm -hmm. going to the gym film workouts train clients that's great but when you've got family you've got a career you're working long hours and you're trying to squeeze stuff in maybe that's not the best program for you. And it's about, you know, one of the things that I try to work with my clients is basically we start at what is optimal. Now, optimal is like a very subjective thing based on the person, based on the goal, based on the circumstance. But let's say you want to build the most amount of muscle possible. There's probably like an on paper optimal way to do that. So then how I would say is basically what's the least amount you can take away from that Mm -hmm. to fit this person perfectly and then that's what 
is then optimal for that person. So yes, it might not be the fantastic program that Joe Schmo uh, has put out on Instagram, but it's about understanding how you can adapt that to get the best results for you, given your circumstances. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think uh, too many people get caught up with that whole optimal way of training. And it's like, mm. it, it, it doesn't, it, it's optimal. If it's optimal for you, there's a kind of like tree of, you know, you need to be able to adhere to it one. And then, you know, you, then, it, yeah. then it, you work backwards from what you can stick to. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You start off with, you know, like, like I say, you get this like, view of, okay, what is theoretically optimal? Okay. Mm -hmm. We know that pretty much only robots can do that. So now how do we make this optimal for an individual and optimal for one person might be completely different for another. In fact, it's probably is going to be completely different for another, but there are sort of threads and veins of consistency that you can kind of pick from good solid training programs that you can apply. And then, you know, uh, a bit like, you know, you would say uh, the principle of fat loss is going to be a calorie deficit. That's the principle, mm -hmm. how you apply and get someone to adhere to that calorie deficit could be very individualized, but there's going to be lots of different threads that are similar or, you know, different uh, ways that you can do that. Yeah. It's the principle that underlies it that remains the same, isn't it? Hmm. And, uh, you know, so for, for those that are listening to the show and they're like, okay, you know, I'm, I do sit behind a desk quite a lot, but I want to, I want to maximize my time in the gym, but I only have, you know, 30, 30 minutes a day or something, you know, they need to just get in on their lunch break. Where do you, hmm. where do you start with these people? Where do you say like, okay, th this is what's going to give you the most bang for your buck and actually you're, you're going to get good results from this. Yeah, so I would generally start right back at square one and look at their calendar and get them to look at what is genuinely realistic about what we're going to do. Is like how many times can you set foot through the through the doors of the gym each and every week? Not necessarily like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm going to start this new program and I'm definitely going to be able to do five times a week. It's going to be amazing, and then you only go once. Um, so, you know, be realistic and start at that, that start point and then make sure that from the beginning, everybody's, if it's you creating the program on your own, so you're having almost like a schizophrenic conversation with yourself is you're on the same page with mind is in the same place as reality. And mm -hmm. you're having this conversation to say, right, yeah, definitely. I can get there three times a week. Absolute max. Um, but maybe I could stretch to four one week, but definitely three. So you start at that point to say, right, okay, what are we working with here? Because, you know, a program that you might develop for someone who is training four times a week versus someone who's training three times a week might be slightly different, might be very similar, but it could um, make a, an impact on that. Mm -hmm. So that would be the, the real start point is what's that realistic um, uh, start point. Then I'd say is from there is, is there a particular type of training that you enjoy? Now, my sort of specialty is in sort of like the resistance training side of things. But mm -hmm. if you like the other brand of throwing stuff around in a, uh, I don't know what that, oh, we're allowed to say the word for, the, for that, yeah. that, that method. Um, if, you, if you like, if you posh circuits, you know, posh circuits in a clock, <laughs> yeah. in, a, in, a, in, a, in an industrial unit somewhere. That, that kind of thing yeah 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 yeah, yeah. wait weights in a box yeah um <coughs> that'll be all right box, so if you, box fitness if, there you go if you like that sort of training then great go do that and yeah. part of you know again linking it back to like the same as you would as your nutrition is as long as you stick into the principle of a calorie deficit what you enjoy is part of that equation and yeah. that would be the same thing from a training point of view so yes, okay, we're going to go three times a week and this is what I really enjoy and this is what I'm going to gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. If you were coming into sort of my realm, shall we say, of resistance training, then I would say if you're looking at, you can, you can make pretty good progress. In fact, damn good progress. If you train hard, three times a week, 45 minutes. You can mm -hmm. make pretty good progress on that. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll, I'll take you through like a 30-minute a variation, which I also use with um, some other clients as well. Mm -hmm. um, but basically a 45 minute workout you can pretty much say right if I pick four exercises per workout then across three workouts I can just make sure that I'm making the most amount of progress possible probably you're going to stick to compound lifts so movements that are going to be multi-joint movements that are going to get lots of muscles working 
that are going to give you most bang for your buck. So don't sit there doing, you know, endless preacher curls and stuff like that, unless your only goal is to get big guns. Yeah. Um, but think about, you know, I guess ladies going to be slightly more, uh, generally speaking, slightly more lower body focused. They want more mm -hmm. glutes and, and hamstrings and things like that. Guys yeah. want like chest, shoulders and stuff like that. So there'll be some variations there, but you're going to stick to maybe some shoulder presses, bench presses, some deadlift variation-ish, some form of squat, some form of hinge, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that would be, if I was giving someone a tip about how to construct a solid training program, is start something that's based on basic movement patterns. So yep. you think about like a movement pattern, either like a vertical press, vertical pull, horizontal push, horizontal pull, hinge, squat. If you cover those bases, across you know multiple different exercises across three workouts and you work hard in those movements you will you will make progress and then it's a case of focusing in on um trying to make incremental strength improvements each and every week now not necessarily going to be able to do that in a completely linear fashion not really going to be possible but you should still be just aiming for right okay i did eight reps last week and my rep range is eight to ten so i'm just going to try and get to nine reps this week okay great and get to ten reps great cool now i'm going to up the weight now i've hit uh, my 10 rep of the uh, the top of the rep range yeah so that would be how i would start to construct it look first at how many times per week can you realistically make it to the gym so mm -hmm. let's say three four five whatever then pick something that you enjoy in terms of the let's call it the modality of training then think about the movements that you're going to use. Generally speaking, compound lifts, focus on those movement patterns as a priority mm -hmm. and then work hard and in trying to incrementally increase strength over time. If that makes sense. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. As you said, people need to work backwards from their calendar. Like you need to be what are you actually going to consistently stick to because adherence is the number one factor for both nutrition and fitness no matter what you're doing mm -hmm. and so there's no point in saying right i'm going to follow this five day a week bro split that i found online if you're yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you can only go two or three times a week um yeah because two or three times a week as you said if you if you do a full body routine and you focus on hitting these different movement patterns squat hinge push pull some kind of core work stability work that kind of thing you get you get most of it done and then it's a case of i love what you said there of choose a rep range and then from there it's like right okay if you're doing eight to ten or six to eight something like that you start with sixes then you next week you go up to sevens next week you go up to eights and then you go back down to the rep range and you increase the load yeah and, so and that's how you progress the way I, <laughs> yeah so the, the the way i talk to talk about it with my clients so you know, often people think about how do I keep progressing in mm. workouts and how do I keep, you know, when do I change shit and when do I kind of move things forward? So generally speaking, what I would say is you would probably look to vary the rep ranges. Um, I, I, again, you don't have to do it all the time as rigidly as this, but let's mm. say every four weeks, you kind of said every four weeks you're going to change a rep range. Now, I would start someone maybe on a higher rep range and bring them down. So maybe start 12 to 15, then come down 10 to 12, then come down 8 to 10. So within each workout, then you say, okay, well, let's pick the weight where you can do, let's say you're doing three sets, for example. You're uh, doing those three sets and you're doing eight repetitions, but that eight rep is pretty tough. Mm -hmm. But So you self-select the weight that allows that feeling to happen then what you're doing is coming back into the gym and incrementally trying to get a little bit more in terms of one rep so that's all i say to my clients is just aim for one rep more don't think about trying to add 20 kilos to the bar just do one rep more then once they get to the top of that rep range for two sets on the trot then you up the weight by the smallest increment possible so with a, it might be a two kilos on the dumbbells. You might have some 1.25s on the bar, whatever. Mm. So that's incrementally adding strength. It's adding progressive overload to that uh, muscle over mm -hmm. time, providing that you're maintaining form. But it's a way just to keep moving forward. Now, obviously, you're going to hit a point where like strength plateaus. No one's just going to go straight off the scale and start bench pressing a ton. But mm. um, you'll get to that point where you can incrementally increase. And then... You know, there's other things that you can do. You can add 
you can add an extra set. So if you're doing three sets, you could add an extra fourth set to those exercises which you really want to improve on. Again, that's going to be a way to keep improving. And then I would say, like, if you get to a point where certain exercises just aren't really moving, they're the ones to kind of switch out. That mm -hmm. would be how I would of approach it and if you're if you're progressing well on an exercise and the exercise is good and it works and you're seeing results there's not a huge amount of reasons to change it you know um, i think one of the things um, as a as a coach is that i've learned over the years is that you've got to have the balls to not change anything yeah and be confident that this person is progressing and doing really well with this exercise so i'm not just going to change it just because i think that they want me to change their program um, i'm going to change it based on the fact that there's data and information and feedback to say this needs a change or if all, everything's going like real smooth as silk let it run yeah but what about confusing the muscles surely you need, oh, yeah. to, do, the, you need to do that don't you, you yeah need to confuse them to shock to confuse the, them to the, grow. the bicep has this little brain that you've got yeah. to kind of trick so yeah if you just kind of just throw some shit at it during a set you get your workout partner just to throw something at your bicep. It shock, shocks you. And then you kind of do an extra rep and maybe injure yourself at the same time. I was going to say, so it would shock, shock you to throw in the dumbbell through the, through the ceiling, <laughs> depending on how explosive your dumb, bicep are. Exactly, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I, I joke about that, but that is one of those myths out there, isn't there? Like if you and I could joke about nutrition myths all night long, but in terms of fitness myths, there is that idea if you need that... Um, constant variation in order to improve uh, which you know is, is actually portrayed in that common fitness regime done in industrial states across the world <laughs> yeah so i think that from a whole shock the body thing then generally speaking it's not a thing um mm -hmm. i think like where it comes from is that anytime you sort of pick up a new exercise you may get like feel a little bit of soreness the next day because it's just a different stimulus it does not mean that you you weren't building muscle before because there's research out there to show that you can build muscle without a huge amount of doms without even any doms whatsoever mm -hmm. um so any of that soreness doesn't necessarily have to be there for you to be growing but if you do something different even if you were to say okay i'm just going to slow the eccentric part of this movement down to instead of doing it two seconds i'm going to do it four that's going to add incremental muscle damage and that's going to potentially lead to some soreness and mm. shocking the body. It doesn't necessarily mean you made any more progress than you if you hadn't have done that. You know, um, so generally speaking, I think that um, for most people, there, there is sometimes a reason why you would change an exercise, not for shocking bodies specifically, but for doing something different and trying to stimulate some of that hypertrophy in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but for the majority of people, especially like beginners, lower level intermediates, you're probably better off having like a core set of exercises that are matched to your goal. So for mm -hmm. example, if you are someone who wants to build chest, shoulders, okay, you've got chest exercises that you find really work for you. You've got shoulder exercises that really work for you, stuff like that. Have these core exercises that for 90% of the year, 80, 90% of the year, never change. Mm. You're just trying to incrementally get better. And incrementally getting better can be anything from form, can be from more repetitions, can be more weight, more sets. You're just trying to incrementally get better, stronger, and grow more muscle on those exercises. Then from a, like an enjoyment point of view, the other ones that are maybe like less important to you, so tricep extensions or bicep curls or whatever, feel free to change all those around because they're all fairly interchangeable yet some mm. are slightly better than others but that's how i would if i was writing my own program and i was say like a listener and right trying to write my own program that's mm. how i would approach it do all the things we said before and then get these core exercises that really work for you and just keep them and keep kind of plugging away at them and change other stuff around them yeah exactly it's prioritizing the, the stuff that's giving you the bigger bang for your buck as you said and um <clears throat> those full body movements as you said and more compound lifts at first in the session are going to work best and if you have time you can throw in accessories on there um mm. and it, as you said it's it's keeping true to the exercises that work for you as long as you're kind of progressing and then only then if you feel like you've hit a bit of a plateau with an exercise you can either 
deload for one, which we can talk about, or you can then mm -hmm. say, right, well, I'm just going to change the variation slightly. You can move from a seated chest press machine to a dumbbell bench press or mm -hmm. a shoulder, you know, a dumbbell shoulder press to a seated shoulder press and just change things around from free weights and machines. Just throw a bit of variation mm -hmm. in there. Um, sure. And then take the same journey. And I guess, uh, I mean, I brought in the, the, the D word there with deloads. Like how often would you look to deload with clients? Would that be fairly auto-regulated based on their progression? Do you like to follow a certain period um, of model? Mm. It's going to be the old classic. It depends. Yeah, <laughs> it's, the, it's the only answer I was looking for. But it depends on what is the key. Yeah. Um, so I would say that generally speaking, I would on, on paper say that deloading at the end of a 12 week training block is mm -hmm. what I generally shoot for. Mm -hmm. So if someone follows the program to the letter as written at the, in the 13th week, we'll dial back and deload. What actually materializes, I would say for, no, I'm going to say 99%. I haven't measured it, but we'll use it as a statistic. Um, <laughs> fact. Non-evidence-based <laughs> statistic coming up. Yeah. You're going to have to put like a little disclaimer. <laughs> disclaimer. Um, we were unable yeah. to interview um, Simon Mitchell through his lack of evidence base. No, don't worry. Yeah. He, he just chucked out statistics like they were freaking coming out of his ass. Um, <laughs> so for, for most people that I coach is that I don't ever go down that route. Yeah. Mainly that's because I've got people who um, got busy jobs who have because of work they maybe have to dial back their training for instead of doing four days a week they're right back to like two or one for a particular week okay in my mind that's a deload i don't yes. need to now program you one if they go on vacation if they're sick things like this that just general life stuff some some general life happening will yeah. occur within 12 weeks and most of the time that serves as the deload so yeah. when someone hits that point of saying uh, oh, I feel sick or I've got the flu or I've got this business travel that I'm doing and it's going to sort of throw my whole regime out of whack. I'm not really concerned about that because in my mind, I'm saying, okay, right. Okay. We were going to probably deload in a month's time. So let's just do it now. Let's not worry about it. Let's not get you thinking about, oh, I've got to do this weird ass hotel workout that because they've got no equipment and you, I'll send you pictures of all this sort of shit. Let's, <laughs> let's just say, right chill out yeah go, go go enjoy the vacation if you want to hop on a treadmill just because that kind of satisfies your brain of saying i feel want to feel active cool go do that if you want mm. to do a few bench presses in the hotel gym cool go go do that but take that little bit of a time off obviously you know you can, there's ways to manage if it's a more extended holiday and things like that but from a deload point of view yeah every 12 weeks at the end of every 12 weeks if everything's run to plan do a deload there but uh, account for life as well yeah i think that's a great point because i think a lot of people will um inevitably freak out if they're trying to follow a set program and then as you said life gets in the way like they have to mm. travel for an extended period they have a holiday uh, they get sick or you know whatever those things and i guess if, if we're looking at more of the, the you know the corporate athlete for want of a better word um that that work travel is actually going to be very consistent for a lot of them um, mm. so sometimes actually having a program that's designed to be done only three days a week actually takes the pressure off. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, there's, there's lots of different things that you can do. So, uh, I'll give you a, like a couple of examples that I've had with different clients. Like one's a li sounds a little bit weird, but it kind of works for the right person. So if someone's like super busy and struggles is I get them to do schedule in exercise every single day seven days so it almost seems counterintuitive like okay well i'm struggling to get to the gym but you're trying to get me to do seven days worth of exercise here but all i'm saying is all i want you to do is schedule 20 minutes where you just do something i don't care if that is you go for a walk i don't care if that is you sit there stretching or you do some mobility work or something or you actually go and do a workout because you, now you've got a bit more time what you find is that that person then gets into the habit of exercise is now my thing. Okay. It may not be every time it's a full on weights workout. Sometimes it is. And mm. sometimes I get to stick to my program, but sometimes I'm just super busy. I'm in a hotel. Okay. I've 
I was just going to jump on the treadmill in the hotel gym, 20 minutes, boom. Okay, great. And it just gets them into that kind of thought process of trying to make their exercise not about, I have to be in a gym. I have to be in a gym. Otherwise, there's no point in doing anything. So that kind of then helps them start to do stuff. And then when they are in the gym, again, they can just fall into their program. So that's like one sort of almost like counterintuitive way. Um, another way you can do it is set up programs whereby you, so I had a client recently who travels for two weeks out of every month. So mm. basically half time at home, half time abroad. Therefore it was a case of, right, we actually need to construct a program that's going to work in um, Timbuktu versus Leicester. Yeah. Now, <laughs> so then you th start thinking, okay, what is the minimal amount of equipment I can get a decent workout in? Mm -hmm. And so we basically just designed a program that was dumbbells and a bench. That was it. Most hotel gyms can give you a dumbbell and a bench. Mm -hmm. So let's design a program that's going to make that work for you. So that, that would be the other thing to do. If you are one of these people who is constantly traveling, you're never in the same gym very consistently, don't program in, right, okay, they've got this really posh hack squat machine. And then you disappear over, oh, they haven't got that, what the hell do I do? I don't know. And then yeah. you can't, can't get that consistency. Whereas a dumbbell is a dumbbell is a dumbbell, and a bench is a bench. So, you know, there's very little that you can't measure progress on. Um, mm. So that would be one other way uh, I would look at it. And again, like it depends on the situation, depends on how much that person's traveling, but there, there are some of the things that you would look at. Yeah. Well, I love the idea of introducing some kind of exercise every day. As you said, it's almost counterintuitive because these people are like, hold on a second. Like I'm really, I'm really fucking busy, but you're just, a case <laughs> of, well, it's a, uh, it's like James Clear says in atomic habits, that idea of kind of, just doing something for two minutes or more um, mm. to get into the habit of, of doing the thing and building, yeah. the, building the little win that is doing some exercise. And then you, yeah. you, you become a person who does exercise every day, whether that is, as you said, just a walk, um, which, which people can rely on if they're, you know, not wanting to do too much in a gym, but. Yeah, and I had um, a client join my program last week and she's got very much um, like a gym anxiety. So mm -hmm. she wants to build muscles. She wants to improve her body composition, but she has this gym anxiety issue. Like many people do when they're first starting out that, you know, everybody's watching them and so on and so forth. Maybe they're not super confident about lifting weights and getting in amongst the bros with their string tight vests and their nipples out and stuff like that. So <laughs> so, uh, so she ha was very anxious about this whole process about um, going to the gym. So I spoke mm -hmm. to her and said, okay, like on a scale of one to 10, where are you right now on this anxiety level? She's like 10, maxed out on like stressing. So I said, well, okay, so what are you stressed about? So she was saying, well, literally about going in, using machines, using weights and people staring at me or judging me or whatever. So then it's a bit like that James Clear thing is like, what's the lowest barrier of entry you can get? And it would be the same thing if someone's like, feels like they're really maxed out with time mm. and this weights program feels like freaking hell, how am I going to get all of this done? So you build it up to be this big thing. So which if, whether it's gym anxiety or whatever, it's just, okay, what's my lowest point of entry and that I can get started with something. So for this particular lady, I said, okay, well, um, how confident would you be about just going into the gym jumping on a treadmill and doing and going for a walk and so she said yeah that'll be all right so i said that's it i said what i want you to do go into the gym and get on a treadmill and walk for 20 minutes and then walk out and she said, oh, you don't want to do any weights or anything I said, no because yes weights are optimal for your goal but they can wait mm. all i want you to do is get into the process and that's often Again, not exactly a direct correlation to maybe someone who's just time crunched, but it's a similar thing. If you feel like you're time crunching, so are you constantly saying to yourself, haven't got the time, haven't got the time, haven't got the time, then it's like, okay, right, what's some form of fitness that just feels too easy? 
Mm-hmm. And let's do that. And once you're then in a stage of, okay, this is great. I can find this. Okay, right. Actually, I thought I had no time, but actually I could, I could have done another 10 minutes here. Mm-hmm. Okay, right. Now we're starting to build on and comes right back to that point you made at the beginning, which is all about the planning side of things as well. If you can sort of plan and find the slots in your calendar where you've got time and things like that, that's hugely important as well. So mm-hmm. yeah, the whole James Clear thing is I'm a, a big fan of, of that and you know, all of that sort of habit type stuff. Yeah, anyone that follows me is sick of me saying his name. To be honest, I, th- I should have got in touch. Should have got in touch with him and, and got some kind of yeah. yeah my, mine's, mine's at home in the bookshelf, um, and uh, I should have got an affiliate link. Really, with the amount that I <laughs> not that not that I have more followers than that guy, but uh, I do bang on about it a bit too much. Um, but yeah, it's like you know, can you find five minutes to to do to do something? And everyone's like, yeah, of course I can. And you're like, okay, well then do it. You know, it's a mm. using that readiness yeah. scale of out of ten to say, look, look out of a scale of one to ten, how likely are you to do this? And if it's not a nine, let's find something easier. Um, yeah, and so even it's, if it's, it's just like a s- step count is a is another one. So for office workers, often step count is low. I think like when I was in an office, my step count was like one to two thousand a day. It was like yeah. something horrific. <laughs> so um, I, a lot of people who I coach are in that exact position Mm. and then you know what I say to them is if you like look at the average person then 15 minutes of solid walking is about 2,000 steps obviously you know there is between person person and Mm. how you're moving etc but then you start to break that down and said right okay could we just increase your step count by like a thousand steps a day so that's like seven and a half minutes of solid walking and could you break seven and a half minutes into one or two walks per day? So like we're talking three minutes, three and a half minutes here. Can you do three and a half minutes worth of walking? Yeah, I could fucking do that. So you were instantly taken like what was, uh, I can't increase a thousand steps to something tangible. Like, can you walk for three and a half minutes twice or three and a half and four <laughs> minutes yeah. twice? Yeah. Yes, I can. Yes, Good. I can. Great. Just go do that. So yeah. often it's about how you frame that goal. And if, especially if you are in this situation where time is, your time poor is when you see, you see these things that are new and you don't necessarily understand maybe how long they take or what's involved, they, they don't seem too tangible. Mm. But when you can, if you can start breaking it down into like real small chunks and say, actually, oh, I can fucking do that. Yeah, I can walk for three and a half minutes. I've been walking since i was a baby i can do that shit <laughs> and, uh, then uh, it's all good to go so yeah. yeah it's about framing it and kind of and again that's like a a personal thing an individual thing finding that the the way of getting that piece of in, piece of information across to a, a client or a person in the right way is i guess like the, the trick but um mm. yeah that's what i say well it's starting with where the client is at isn't it um, you know, you start with where their step count is at, you start with where their exercise habits are at, because even as, as we said there about in the very beginning, we were like, right, let's start with full body workouts three times a week. But for some of these people that might be well beyond where they're at. And, uh, mm-hmm. and even if it's like the woman that you said that you worked with there, where she went in and just did the treadmill, you know, you could say to a client, if, well, you could think this in your head as the coach, right? If I know that this person wants to like push, pull, squat, hinge, um, and do a couple of other bits you're like why don't i just program like one exercise a day and it's like just go in and just do like the just do chest press for three sets of 10 and then walk out and they're like what and that's it and it's like I'd, yeah i'd love that but tomorrow <laughs> yeah tomorrow go and do, <laughs> go and do seated row and then the third day do leg press and then the fourth day let's do uh, you know a kettlebell swing or, or well probably less less technical but do you see what I mean? It's like it's if if these people looked at it this way and thought about doing something, I guess rather than trying to make something perfect, they'd find themselves using you know building the blocks higher and higher over yeah. time. Yeah, and I think that um, we're all human beings, and you know whether it's exercise or you know like when I was in the corporate world, things like projects and stuff like that, or new stuff that you had to do, you kind of always shy away from it because you kind of look for the last, the path of least resistance and kind of sticking to what you know and stuff like that. So that's kind of human behavior. So if you can create these 
um, small little wins along the way and that creates that snowball of momentum that's a, a really good way to do it and I think that you know yeah it's it's a case of a planning b being realistic and then c if you like coming up to these issues is finding the creative ways that are going to get you through that yeah I think that's that mindset as well of uh if something gets in the way, how do you get around it rather than just being like, right, okay, fuck it. I tried to be healthy. What's the point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think um, that, and it's like a, the, probably like the main point, because let's be honest, is no one's going to plain sail the whole thing. You know, whether it is fat loss, whether it's building muscle, trying to gain strength in the gym, it's never going to be this like, oh yeah, each workout was just like, better than the last and i've never hit a single problem you're always going to hit roadblocks you're going to have things that knock you off course you're going to have you know maybe you have injuries illnesses vacations all sorts of stuff is going to happen it's never just going to be a process where right clear the decks for the next three months um i'm going all of that this fitness thing and nothing's going to get in my way Mm. that's like okay great um and you know maybe like a social media thing is a necessary to blame but um it's a lot of rah 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 insp- inspirational quote motivation rah 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 but um very it's not realistic <laughs> so, and, you can achieve you, know, any, you can achieve anything you like can i yeah yeah just just believe <laughs> um but um so yeah so i think that a, a case of there is that i think it's it's real though like, social media i guess in a certain respect builds it up to be you should be this walking, talking ball of motivation all mm-hmm. the time, mm-hmm. but that's just not realistic. And you know, when you f- when you feel like you've fallen foul of that high expectation that you feel like you have to set for yourself, mm-hmm. then you start to feel, oh, what's the fucking point? Yeah. Whereas I'm not saying necessarily you should set your goals low, <laughs> but um, the realist, yeah. the realistic but, kids were all average. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just be marginally above average. Yeah. It'd be brilliant. Yeah. Um, so um, I don't say like just have low goals, but I think it's a case of having the mindset when you go in there is that this is never going to be perfect, and you know I'm never going to have a smash fest of a workout each and every time I set foot through the door, mm. and it's about as cliche as it sounds that consistency over perfection and saying, well, if I do the right things often enough, then net net result, I'm going to be better off than I was when I started. And, um, and I think that that's some people don't like that because I want to, I want to get shredded in a week. And it's like, all right, well, let's, let's just get you through the door of the gym first. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, Maybe we've got like um, a month or six weeks of solid progress. And now we can start to build on this solid foundation and go from there. Um, I think that that's, you've got to think about it more of a, a long-term thing. And then it starts to, I think all the things will fall into place. Everything will start to work and it'll be a dream. It'll be a yeah. shredded dream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. I think it's a, that whole like consistency breeds success consistency breeds results is uh is what all of us who are smart and well educated you know like you and i uh hashtag top, <laughs> hashtag top coaches you know try to try to portray uh but it's just not sexy simon you know people want their results and they want them now you know yeah, what's, yeah. what's the point what, why wait why wait 16 weeks if you can have them in eight weeks if you just try a bit harder and, and burn yourself into the ground yeah exactly and i think that you know um, I, I did a post about this like probably uh, quite a while ago, but it was a thing about basically like we live in a world now where everything's freaking instantaneous. Like mm. you've got your phone here with all the apps on it. You know, you can order food. It's delivered to you. You can swipe left and right and hook up with a girl or a guy, if that's your thing. Um, and you, you don't have, you can stream any movie or whatever you want from without moving a muscle. You can do pretty much anything you want without doing a lot these mm-hmm. days. Mm-hmm. Whereas real, making real changes in your physique, if you want to build muscle or you want to lose body fat, there's no app for that, as they say. And it takes hard work and it takes effort. And you know, as much as people will sell you the you know, ripped abs in four days and the detox 
tea that will miraculously melt body fat mm. is that it's, it's just not true. And yes, anybody can um, starve themselves and lose a lot of weight very quickly. But what happens after the, the 30 day starvation diet? Mm. You know, normal life comes back in and you haven't built up any skills, you haven't built up any habits, and it just kind of falls apart and you're back into that same loop and that same cycle. And that's part of the reason why I've drifted away from 12 week programs, 90 day, things like that. I don't put mm. any numbers on my programs anymore mm. because um, I, what I was finding was that people felt like any goal that they wanted was achievable in 90 days Yeah, uh, from <clears throat> any start point. And, and there's just no it's not like that it's not any start point and you're going to get shredded in 90 days that's not how it works and maybe for your lifestyle with you know if you're busy and if you've got like um family and things like that maybe lifestyle that you've got right now and you know the other competing priorities that you have mean that you can't make progress that fast mm. and therefore you've just going to have to maybe say well, instead of three months, my personal progress and what is going to be great for me is six months or seven months or eight months. And I think, again, that comes back to, to being realistic and it comes back to, um, you know, but it is, it is very difficult because if I wasn't necessarily doing the job I'm doing now and being on the outside looking in, I probably would look at these programs and see, okay, yeah, that dude got shredded in eight weeks. So yeah, definitely, I'm going to get the same results. Yeah. Um, yes, you might if the circumstances work, but I think you want to maybe set yourself up for, for realism rather than failure and disappointment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's tough. It's tough. Like I, I personally have an eight week program, but it's, you know, purely nutrition based and I'm very I'm sure it's a good one. <laughs> thanks mate yeah yeah so uh, don't don't do timed programs but i'm trying to sell one right it's open monday uh yeah no but like I, i'm very upfront at the start of it in terms of you know this is about building better habits and i'm like you know i'm going to teach you actually the principles of what you need to learn and it's not going to be easy and it's going to be quite hard work and we're going to like we're going to be work on habits week in week out and you know and, it, I'm and i very think there's a about that and that's you know probably why it doesn't sound I, I think there's a, a a massive difference between saying you know you can get significant results and make significant body composition changes in eight mm -hmm. weeks mm -hmm. versus the sensationalist you're gonna get absolutely massively freaking shredded yeah. to the bone photo shoot ready and the guy who is 20 kilos overweight is not going to get that in eight weeks yeah. whereas I'm sure if you say in eight weeks, we're going to build solid habits, we're going to do X, Y, Z, you're going to make significant progress towards your goals. That's a whole different marketing ball game. Exactly. Cool. Let's be digging myself out of the hole. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't worry about it. You know, it's all good. No, but that, that's exactly why I say what I say. And, uh, and, and you make a really good point. It's a case of being realistic with your time and, and being realistic with these things and knowing that actually for long-term change, it's going to be a journey because you didn't get to where you were at in six to eight weeks. So why do you think that you'll sure. get to somewhere else in that time, depending on your start point and your circumstances and, and all the other stars aligning? Uh, Indeed. Cool, man. I mean, you know, for the, for the too lazy didn't listen, for the TLDL, uh, for those of you who are very busy, be honest with what you can achieve in the gym prioritize movements that work more muscle groups and be efficient with your time and then progress things by actually logging down your training i think we've pretty much covered it indeed is there anything yeah, else we did well great is there a you know any places that you want to direct people to at the moment where can they find out more about you and your uh, obsession about star wars and other things <laughs> sure um so in terms of social media I hang out the most on instagram at iron underscore paradise underscore fitness you can DM me on there if you want to, or give me a follow. Go and do that. Don't slide, lazy. slide um, into DMs. Indeed. Um, you can also go to ironparadisefitness.com where you find like articles and stuff like that on nutrition and training. So if you're into the resistance training side of things, you want some information on that. Um, I, I've also got my own podcast. You can check that out. Um, there's links on my Instagram. Uh, so go listen to that. I do swear a lot. So um, be warned. Yeah. Uh, don't listen to it if you don't like swearing. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's all right we've dropped a few, we've, we've dropped a few in here which might have shocked people because I'm, I'm usually quite like posh and pretentious on here uh so these oh, people so, so, sorry i did oh no i didn't ask before <laughs> I, I i i led the way with one of my own anyway like i've got pretty bad language in real life so at least people okay. know, know realistically oh. what, what i'm about yeah. Yeah, cool, mate. D- dm me with some hate mail if you like <laughs> nah, cool <laughs> right thanks Simon. thank you very much for being on no worries, brother. Good to be here.